Ani uh, Buzu, thank you so much for uh, for coming, and I'm uh, I'm uh, happy to be here today on uh, Algonquin territory. It's true, I'm a journalist at the Toronto Star, um, and how I got involved with the story was actually um, because of Stan Berdy. In 2011, I had pitched to my editors. I was a national reporter for the Star. And I had pitched to my editors um, a story about the federal election. I desperately wanted to join the, um, the election coverage. And um, I pitched a story on why it is that uh, Indigenous people in Northern Ontario were not voting. Now, I knew why this was. Um, 2011, I'll refresh your memory, that was the year Stephen Harper was duking it out against Jack Layton. Um, and I knew um, that... Uh, First Nations people did not have the vote until 1960. And I knew that um, as part of the reason why there's, um, at that point, there wasn't any, uh, not very much movement with voting. So I, I told this to my editors in Toronto, and they're like, okay, that's, that sounds like a great story. Why don't you go up to Thunder Bay and, so, um, and, and write it? So I did, and I went, and I went to go meet Stan. And at the time, Stan was a, was a grand chief of Anishinaabe Aski Nation. Um, and I'm going to tell you that, uh, a little bit about Anishinaabe Aski Nation. And I have to sort of also apologize. I speak in circles. I sort of, I start something and I'll come right back to it. And hopefully I will have a point. <laughs> so um, so let's, let's hope. Anyway, so um, I, I go up there, I sit down with Stan, and um, I start to ask Stan questions. I'm like, Stan, uh, how come... Um, how come First Nations people uh, don't want to vote in the election? And Stan looked at me and he said, why aren't you writing a story about Jordan? And I thought, oh, Stan's clearly not hearing what I'm saying, so I'll throw out another question. And so uh, I asked Stan another question. I'm like, well, you know, come on, uh, Stan, if people were to, um, to move in certain areas, you could swing votes in certain ridings. And then he looked at me and he said, Jordan's been missing for 70 days. And then I stopped. And um, I tried one more time. I tried one more question. Um, I asked him, I said, well, you know, don't you think that um, the, the policies of the NDP could somehow uh, coincide with um, some Indigenous concerns? And then he looked at me again, and he said, we found a shoe down by the water, and we think it's Jordan's. So I stopped, and I paused uh, for a second, and I thought to myself, okay, you know what? Um, you're not getting the answers that you came here for. You need to sort of sit down for a minute, remember who you are, where you are, and who you're listening to. Stan is um, the Grand Chief of Nan, and he's also your elder, and he's trying to tell you something, and you're not listening. So at that point, I, I really do like to think what happened was I opened my ears to what he was saying, and um, Stan told me, that um, Jordan was the seventh student from Northern Ontario to die or go missing since 2000 in Thunder Bay. And when he said that to me, that um, touched a, a lot of nerves in me um, for a number of reasons. Um, I only have 15 minutes, so I can't go on. But uh, there is, um, there's a story of the seven prophecies, and when Stan told me that Jordan was number seven, that, to me, inside, sort of set off an alarm bell, thinking, uh, what, wait a second, this, this, the number seven is so significant in Anishinaabe culture. Um, it deals with prophecies and fires, and it talks about the, um, the settlement of, of the Anishinaabe on Turtle Island, which is a continent of North America. And there are different prophecies. Each prophecy has a different number. Number seven is very important. So this was in my mind. And um, Stan began to also tell me that, um, he goes, you know, the, the students, they're, they're here in Thunder Bay because there is no high school for them in their, in their home communities. And I'm like, okay. And he's saying, you know, the thing is, is that there are no high schools. And so the kids leave and they're 14 years old and they're 15 years old. And they come down, they travel 500, 600 kilometers by themselves to, to go to school um, in Thunder Bay in a boarding house. Um, oftentimes, too, the kids, they, they don't know anyone here. They come from places where um, there are no street lights. They come from places where there are no movie theaters. Oftentimes, there are no, um, there are no malls. It's, English isn't their first language, and so it's a culture shock to come to Thunder Bay, um, to be in a big city oftentimes, and they can be alone. 
So Stan is telling me all of this, and then Stan tells me, come, let me take you on a drive. So I said, okay. So we got into Stan's pickup truck, and um, he popped in the gospel music in his, in his truck. And uh, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, what's, what's up with this? Now we're listening to gospel music. And then Stan tells me a story. Um, and he says, um, I asked him, I said, Stan, why are we listening to, to this music about God? And then Stan said to me that when, um, when he hears uh, gospel music, it reminds him about his son, Daniel. And his son, Daniel, um, he died when he was 19 years old. He had come to go to high school in Thunder Bay and live with his parents. Um, and he died, um, actually, after being beaten at a party at Fort William First Nation. Um, so this, to me, you know, Stan is thinking about his children, the seven children. He's thinking about his, his son. We're in the truck, and we drive to the Kaministiqua River. I get out of the, um, of the truck, and I'm feeling kind of queasy when I look around, and I realize where we are. And where we are is we're at the base of Mount McKay. And Mount McKay is the, um, is the spiritual center of, um, of Fort William First Nation, and uh, that's my grandmother's reserve. My kids had been on top of Mount McKay many times, you know, running in the grass, looking over top and seeing the beautiful, uh, seeing the beautiful view that you can see of Thunder Bay. And um, Stan said to me, this is where we think we last saw um, Jordan. This is where the shoe was found. I began to write news articles then of, um, of the seven. I um, never did write that story of the 2011 election. Still do, I think. Um, and uh, that, that meeting uh, really did sort of, sort of change, um, change the course of, of my writing career. And uh, at that point, I knew that I would, I would one day hopefully write a book on, on this. Um, because this is a story that um, is not just about Thunder Bay. It's not just about one city. This is a story about Canada. This is a story about so many things because you have to look at the deaths of the kids in so many different ways. You have to look at broken treaties. You have to look at the legacy of the residential school system and how from the mid 1880s to 1996, 150,000 Indigenous kids were taken out of their homes, their families, their languages, um, their hair was cut, their clothes were taken away, and they were sent to schools to assimilate into Canadian culture. And that was, that was the thought. Um, that, those legacies of that residential school system, I believe, can be seen today in the fact that we still do not have schools in the north or on um, in First Nations communities that still need them. And what we're doing still today is we're sending our kids away from these communities and they're going away to live, to go to school somewhere else and not be with their families. Um, there are so many echoes um, of the past here. So this is a story about many things. This is very much a story about Canada and um, I'm going to start tonight with reading about the first boy that, uh, that went missing. And I'm also going to tell you, too, that why I'm starting with this is because um, I was just talking to his aunt, um, Dora Morris, today. I keep in contact with, uh, with um, the people that I, I've written about and the families. Um, and if it wasn't for the strength of the families, this book um, really, honestly, would not have been written. So I'm going to start with Jethro Anderson. Um, it was uh, Jethro's birthday on October 1st. Um, he turned 15. Um, he disappeared later on in October. He had just um, the, the first, uh, the Dennis Franklin Cromartie um, school, high school, had just opened in 2000. That beginning actually was around his birthday when the school opened, beginning of October. Um, and this is a really, really cool thing because um, the Northern Anishinaabe Education Council, they had um, bought the school in Thunder Bay, so all the kids could come down and go to school there. And so this was really, really a good thing. But um, this is part of also part of colonialism because what happens, you see, is that um, INAC is still giving out money for uh, the education systems, but they don't give out enough for schools like DFC because oftentimes they, um, they, what gets forgotten are northern quotients. And sometimes, you know, when kids need things and to go home, that money goes, comes out of operating budgets of, of the school. 
Um, it's really expensive to fly anywhere in the north, and sometimes these kids, understandably, when you're 14 and 15, can feel really homesick and you want to go home. Anyway, so here's my circle again. So we're going, um, we're going to go and speak about, I'm going to speak right now about Jethro and um, what happened one week after he disappeared. You should know, too, that um, Jethro was staying with his aunt, um, his aunt, Dora Morris, this other woman I was just talking about. Um, and she was like a surrogate mom for, for him. She really loved him, and she cared for him for actually um, a large part of his life. And Dora sat down and told me about, about Jethro. One week after Jethro's disappearance, Dora got a call asking her to come down to Dennis Franklin. Police had set up a command post in the school parking lot. They had found a pair of black lace-up boots by the shoreline and wanted to, they wanted Dora to see if they were Jethro's. She left her house immediately. When she arrived at the command post, her heart was racing. Police showed her the boots. They weren't Jethro's. They asked if she was sure. The boots were found tied together down by the river. She said she was certain and then left, thinking that maybe her nephew was still out there. About a week later, someone from DFC phoned Dora and asked her to come down to the school once again. Once again, she steeled her nerves. She remembered walking into a room full of people. There was one, maybe two officers. She had no idea who the others in the room were, but figured they were, in the, they were with the school. She made a beeline for the brown paper bag the police had. Inside was a black cap with the brand FUBU written across in giant letters. She knew right away it was Jethro's. Police asked her if she was certain. They told her that this type of cap was sold in lots of sports stores around town. Everyone had one. She told them again, without a doubt, that the hat was Jethro's. She closed the paper bag and pushed it away. Then she ran out the door. Dora was a mess when she got into her van. Her mind was racing. She was hysterical and spilling tears of anger. She started to drive. But this time, she wasn't combing the streets looking for Jethro. This time, she drove to the highway. She put her foot on the gas and headed straight out of town. She went north toward Gull Bay and was gone for three hours, maybe more, crying her heart out. When she arrived back in the city, she went straight to see Ron Kanutsky, her son's counselor. When she got to his office, she saw he was on the phone. He looked up, startled. He was trying to phone her. He asked Dora if it was her nephew Jethro that was missing. He had just read about it in the newspaper, which was open on his desk. Dora cried. She told Ron everything. She told him what had happened, how she had been looking for Jethro, how his hat had been found. She said no one had believed her when he first went missing. She begged Ron to help. She wanted him to get the police to start dragging the river. She had a feeling. She knew Jethro was in the water. Ever since Adrian's friend told Dora about the spot by the river where the kids went to drink, she had been drawn to the water. She would drive to that particular place every day, scanning, searching, and wondering. One day, about a week after he was gone, a feeling washed over her while she was driving around. She just knew Jethro was in the river. She remembered how Jethro hated having a bath when he was a young boy. At the time, they were living at Big Trout near Casabonica, and Jethro had come to stay with her and Tom and the kids. He was just eight years old. Her house was full of little ones, all under the age of 10. She remembered being in the bathroom with Jethro. She drew the warm water and spoke to him while helping him remove his clothes from his spindly little body. She remembered he stood there, shaking uncontrollably. He was afraid of the water. She drove home in a fury and blew in like a storm, telling the kids that it was time to go fishing. She went running through the house, getting their rods, their jackets, and their boots. Startled, the kids asked why they were going fishing. She told them she thought Jethro was in the river. The kids got upset. She stopped. She realized what she was doing, what she was saying, then she put the rods away. But every day after, she would go down to the river, sometimes twice a day. She would park her car and scan the rushing water. Maybe he had dropped something, a clue, something only she would recognize. But every day, nothing. It's not easy to drag a river, and the cam's a cold, swift snake. Boats with large poles attached to hooks motor oh so slowly on the water, fighting its force. 
On Friday, November 10, a team from Casabonica was organized to search the river, and police came with their boats. Dora went down to the camp the next morning, Saturday, November 11th, Remembrance Day. She spoke to some of the indigenous searchers who told her they were coming up empty. The river was cold and unforgiving, and they were thinking about stopping for the day. She begged them not to. She had a feeling. She asked them to persevere and finish out the day. As the police and the search team continued to scour the water, Dora went home and she waited. In the early evening, someone from DFC asked her to come down to the auditorium for an emergency meeting. She told her children she was going to the school, that there was a break in the case. Elation broke out amongst the children. They thought Jethro had been found. Their cousin was coming home. But Dora knew better. She told them to stay home and wait. She muted their excitement, told them not to get their hopes up. Dora remembers heading to the DFC auditorium and walking through the big steel doors. The gym was packed. Students, searchers, community members, family, everyone was there. Dora can't remember who broke the news. She just remembers the gym erupting into chaos. The crying, the moaning, the screaming swirled around her. Jethro's body had been recovered from the river. It is important to know, to know this. Dora never received a call from the Thunder Bay police informing her that Jethro's body had been found. Dora had filed the missing person's report. She had called the force multiple times, asking to speak to someone, wondering if they had any leads. She had begged them to get in the fishing boat, get out the long hooks, and drag the bottom of the river. She was never given the common courtesy of a phone call, not from the Thunder Bay police or the Thunder Bay coroner's office, who retrieved the body from the funeral home and performed the autopsy. Instead, this is what Dora saw, a press release from the Thunder Bay Police that went out on Saturday, November the 11th. Police immediately came to the conclusion that foul play was not a factor, that Jethro went into the river of his own accord in late October, when the warmth of the northern sun slips into below zero blackness at night. Dora was livid. There was no way her Jethro went into the water voluntarily or tripped in and fell. She called the police after. She spoke to the chief demanding to see the autopsy report. She was refused and told only the parents could get access to that information. She would have to ask her brother, Estella. When Jethro's body was released to the funeral home, she drove there with Jethro's other aunt, Saloma Anderson, and demanded that the funeral director show them Jethro's body. They wanted to see for themselves. The funeral director refused, telling them the body was not something any relatives should see, that it was going to be a closed casket service. Bodies change after they've been in the water. They would not recognize Jethro. Dora was defiant. I told him I wasn't leaving. The funeral director eventually relented. She took a few minutes to compose herself before he brought them inside and opened the casket. Dora remembers looking at Jethro and thinking that he didn't look as bad as the director had made out. But when she looked more closely, she saw a three-inch wide gash starting from the top of his forehead and ending to the middle of his head. There were round contusions on his cheek. She immediately thought it looked like someone had extinguished their cigarette butts on his face. She checked his tummy. It wasn't bloated. She looked at his hands, which weren't purple or blown up with water. Dora took in a sharp breath. She knew she was right. This was no accident. 